Well, it is a pleasure for me to welcome all of you today to this webinar on the development of community anti-drug coalitions in the Philippines. I'm Eric Siervo. I'm the Vice President of International Programs at, at CADCA, or Community Anti-Drug Coalitions of America. And with me today, I'm accompanied on this panel by Dr. Raquel Tolentino and Ms. Redora Angosillo from the Association of Anti-Drug Abuse Coalitions in the Philippines, uh, also known as ADAC Phil. During today's webinar, I'm going to be providing an overview on CADGA and its model for community change and how this community change model has been adapted and adopted in now over 28 countries around the world. Uh, and specifically, we're going to take a deep dive into how this model has become its own unique experience uh, or movement for community change within the context of the Philippines. So just to give you a little bit of a background on CADCA, CADCA was founded in 1992 as part of a presidential drug advisory council. And that drug advisory council was made up of coalition leaders from uh, throughout the United States. And uh, at the time, it was really the first national gathering of community coalitions. Uh, but it was also an important step in our country's um, appreciation for the need of a prevention infrastructure where you literally had boots on the ground in communities uh, where local uh, residents and stakeholders uh, were getting mobilized and organized to solve their own issues. So as a result of that experience, uh, CADCA was developed to be an umbrella organization uh, with the sole purpose to help strengthen uh, the capacity of communities to form community coalitions with a focus of creating and maintaining safe, healthy, and drug-free communities. Uh, today, CADCA represents more than 5,000 community coalitions globally. So now that I've discussed uh, a little bit about CADCA as an organization, I want to talk specifically about its model for community change. Uh, and before we go deep into the community change model, uh, there's, there's, you know, two main goals that I really want to highlight for you that this model is predicated on. The first of which uh, is that you need to increase collaboration among groups or sectors within a specific community. Uh, so main goal number one is that increasing that collaboration among groups and sectors. Uh, but the other key to this equation is that those sectors need to come together uh, to carry out uh, data-driven plans and strategies to achieve population level reductions in substance use and misuse rates. Uh, so again, these are things that we can measure over time through this process. And one is increasing the collaboration among groups and sectors but the other side of that equation is that we want to see substance use rates go down over time among youth and adults. And those are the two main goals behind CADCA's community change model uh, that we're going to uh, explore in further detail. So in order to achieve these two main goals, uh, community coalitions serve as the perfect vehicle to really manage those two parallel processes simultaneously. And CAC has defined a community coalition as a formal collaboration or agreement between groups and sectors of a community by bringing together neighbors, organizations, and representatives from public and private institutions where each group re retains its unique identity, but they all agree to come together to work collectively to share knowledge, skills, resources, risks, and rewards uh, towards working collectively to achieve the common goal of building a safer, healthier community for all of those who, who live and work and share within that specific community context or environment in which they call home. 
So now that we've talked a little bit about the two main goals and how community coalitions allow us to achieve those goals, we need to talk about the, th the pillars or the process that makes up CADCA's community change model. And this community change model uh, really has three key components. And, uh, and, and the first of those components or pillars is 12 community sectors. So when we talk about bringing together uh, representatives and community sectors, and when we're talking about neighbors, institutions, and organizations, what, are, what is it that we're really talking about? And so the 12 community sectors are something that is universal and you find in communities throughout the world, and it really serves as a key you know, tool in order to determine the resources and the skills and the abilities and the talent that you can find right there in your own community. And so when coalitions uh, need to be developed, uh, one of the first tools that, uh, that we train them on and we provide uh, information on this is they really have to do kind of a resource analysis and identify where these 12 community sectors are. Uh, and when I talk about community tech sectors, I'm talking specifically uh, about your local businesses, your media, your schools, youth serving organization, law enforcement, civil and volunteer organizations, religious and fraternal groups, healthcare professionals, your local government, uh, as well as organizations that uh, have expertise on substance use. Uh, but we also want to have youth at the table. And when I say have youth at the table, it's not really about lecturing young people about why the dangers of drugs and why they're bad. No, on the contrary, it's about ha letting them have a seat and a voice at the table as equals, as another sector, because if they're the ones that we want to protect, uh, we need to know what they know in terms of what the risks look like in their community. And we also need to give them a space uh, to be advocates for change. Uh, and so when we talk about youth, they're the most important sector because it's the group that we want to that we want to protect. But we need to empower them to have a voice. And when we bring all of these key sectors together, again, we'll find the knowledge, the skills, the abilities and the resources needed to create local solutions to local problems. Now, the 12 community sectors uh, really allow communities and coalitions to achieve that first goal of increasing collaboration among groups and sectors of a community. But for that second goal of reducing substance use rates over time, uh, we have a second pillar component to this process, which is the strategic prevention framework. And the strategic prevention framework really is a roadmap to help communities uh, work through a process that will allow them to achieve outcomes such as reductions in substance use. But as opposed to just, uh, you know, having a perception of what you believe the problem might be, you know, the process starts with assessing uh, prevention needs based on epidemiological data. Uh, in, in essence, communities have to go out and find out what's happening in their community learning what substances have the greatest impact, what population is the most vulnerable associated to the substance that's being used, what are the risk factors associated to the presence of those substances in the community, and how do they manifest themselves within that local community context. Uh, that information is important because it's going to give communities uh, what they need to put in place a data-driven approach because based on that data, they're going to be able to determine what type of capacity they need to build in order to answer the question of what the problem is in the community and how they see themselves going about uh, changing that situation and how they'd like to see their community look like, say, from here to three years from now to five years from now and develop strategic plans and strategies to be able to get uh, to that, to those outcomes. And when we talk specifically about outcomes, we're talking about communities uh, doing effective prevention in terms of uh, not just looking at gaps within specific services and programs around prevention, but also looking at the policies and the practice and the system within that community context and also 
what needs to change there in order to have a bridge between the needs in the community context and the resources that are there. Now, also through this process, coalitions need to look and see how effective they're being in achieving those types of outcomes. So an evaluation is important uh, in order to know if they're being effective in achieving their goals uh, to creating a safer, healthier community. Uh, but also sustainability is a key component. It's not just about sustaining the coalition, uh, but it's also sustaining their efforts, uh, community changes and outcomes over time. Uh, the two important pieces here though, is that the 12 community sectors uh, really again, allows them to see all the resources that they have locally that they can generate, uh, but two, they also have a credible process in place to lead them towards outcomes. So again, these two goals, are very important in being able to measure impact and outcomes over time is key. So that's uh, you know where the strategic prevention framework uh, helps communities uh, to get to where they need to go. In addition to the strategic prevention framework, there's also a third pillar or a key component uh, in order for community coalitions to achieve that second goal. Uh, one of the things that I talked about uh, with the strategic prevention framework uh, was about services, programs, policies, practices, and changes in system. Uh, now that is easier said than done. And a lot of times our prevention efforts tend to really focus on programs and direct services or more individual strategies. Uh, but in order to do the policy changes and the systems changes, we really need to look at the environment and the environmental strategies that we can do in order to achieve uh, those, uh, those types of outcomes, not just the individual, but the environmental context as well. Now for that, uh, the next uh, tool in the toolkit for CADCA's community change model are seven strategies uh, for community change. And one of the things that coalitions can do with these seven strategies is really develop a comprehensive campaign about what needs to change and how they're going to go about changing it. And again, they have these seven strategies to be able to achieve that. Uh, rather than going into detail on these seven strategies, I'm going to let our partners from the Philippines share how within their context, uh, they've been able to use these seven strategies uh, to achieve community change. Now, in order to implement uh, this community change model, we actually have a framework uh, for it, which really highlights the process uh, that unfolds as uh, a process that starts with CADCA's training and technical assistance. Uh, but it's, it's not enough to just provide training and technical assistance and hope that coalitions are going to be formed. No, we, we need people that we need to work with on the grounds to accompany communities through this process. And our partner in the case of the Philippines is the Association of Anti-Drug Abuse uh, Coalitions of the Philippines. Now, uh, CADCA provides the training and technical assistance, but really ADAC-PHIL is that provider on the ground that accompanies the communities through this process when, when we're not around. Um, and, and this is an important piece because, you know, by nature, all these groups and sectors don't normally just come out of their silos to work together. So we do need to accompany these, commu uh, these communities uh, as we work to develop coalitions through this process. And that first step is to establish a coalition and enhance capacity. But in order to do that, uh, what they're taught in the classroom can't stay in the classroom. It has to be applied out in the field, out in the community. And once we're able to achieve that and coalitions are formed and their capacities enhanced, uh, the communities and coalitions start pursuing the implementation of essential processes. Now, that's just a real fancy way of saying um, the pillars that we already talked about, the 12 sectors and getting all the sectors together to, to one, form a coalition, and then two, implementing that strategic prevention framework. And, you know, doing the things associated to it, like doing a community assessment, developing strategic plans, um, you know, evaluating their efforts and sustaining them over time. Um, and once they go through and start implementing those essential processes, they're going to start pursuing comprehensive strategies. And what do I mean by those comprehensive strategies? I mean those seven strategies that we just talked about briefly 
that were about doing individual and environmental strategies and developing a comprehensive campaign in order to be able to achieve community change. Well, once they start implementing those essential, uh, I'm sorry, those comprehensive strategies, they're going to move towards being able to achieve community change or create community change within their community context. And then overall, that's going to lead them to improved population level outcomes. And, you know, specifically the population level outcome we're talking about here is the one we mentioned at the very beginning in terms of that main goal of being able to reduce substance use rates over time among youth and adults. So I do want to take a moment now to summarize all of this, uh, as it's a lot of information, but really all of this starts by impacting a specific community uh, that's been identified for coalition development. Um, in the case of the Philippines, a lot of times uh, that specific community is gonna, that's going to be impacted is, uh, you know, identified at the bottom guy level. Uh, but the first step in this process is really to engage all of the community sectors. So really, you know, within that physical space in the community, really start to, you know, find yourself within that space and start identifying where all of these community sectors are. Uh, and, uh, you know, a lot of community coalition work is done through mapping. So uh, one first step is about, you know, um, really mapping out where your schools are, where your where your churches are, uh, where your law enforcement is, and really mapping out all those community sectors because it is a form of a resource assessment to know what it is that you need to work with and harness within that community context. But then the other piece is the uh, being able to implement uh, the things, tools like the strategic prevention framework to understand the conditions within that community setting in terms of like really the hotspots, where are substances being bought, sold and used and being able to kind of put red dots on that map and start identifying where those where those problems are within the community context. And then the seven strategies, again, really allows us to pr promote and pursue comprehensive strategies. And again, so the thing about it is a comprehensive campaign. Every time you've got one of those little hot spots within your community context, you know, it's not just about going out and do a simple strategy, but you've got to do all seven of these strategies to really uproot the problem. And what we want to see happen is over time, those little red dots or hot spots in your community begin to disappear over time. Uh, and by doing that, you know, you have to achieve the change in the community context in order for those spots, hot spots to disappear over time. Uh, but through that, you've got the collaboration between the groups and sectors uh, and the plans and strategies needed to bring about the kinds of change that reduce substance use throughout the entire community context. Now, in the United States, CATCA's model for community change is being applied in all 50 states and U.S. territories. And that's made possible through a national program that we have known as Drug-Free Communities. Uh, and Drug-Free Communities is uh, a program that was enacted into law back in 1998. And it was the second time in our country's history that they recognized the importance of having community coalitions as part of a prevention infrastructure. Uh, but it was also at that time that it became an official part of our country's national drug control strategy and resources were allocated to help develop community coalitions across the country. Uh, today, we have over 2,000 community coalitions that have participated in this program since its inception uh, back in 1998. And more, most recently, we have over 700 active coalitions uh, that are currently participating in this program. Um, and I do have to mention that CADCA uh, wasn't only a driving force in working with our national government uh, to get the passage of this act through, but we're also the training and technical assistance provider for every coalition that has to go through this program. So they're all trained uh, by CADCA on the same essential processes, those three pillars that we talked about, that's applied all throughout the United States and all these communities uh, where they're working to uh, create safe, healthy, and drug-free communities through the Drug-Free Community Support Program. So I want to take a moment to talk about the outcomes of the Drug-Free Community Support Program. You know, uh, towards the beginning of the presentation, I mentioned that there were two main goals, the second of which was reducing substance use rates 
uh, over time. And uh, that's something that we're able to demonstrate with a drug-free community support program. Uh, so if you see the, the two charts that are here in front of you, the one on the left really looks at all of the community coalitions that have gone through this program since its inception back in 1998, uh, all the way to the most recent data that I have here for 2016. And when, you're, uh, when you look at the chart on the left, uh, you see that uh, that you know they're measuring data on past 30-day use for middle school and high school students on four specific substances: alcohol, marijuana, tobacco, and prescription drugs. Uh, and as you can see, um, I won't go through each and every one of these, but as you can see, just looking at the example of uh, alcohol, we're seeing reductions of 27% uh, for alcohol use among youth, as well uh, as 19% uh, for high schoolers. Um, and then we also have uh, some interesting reductions in tobacco, marijuana, and uh, prescription drugs. Now, uh, this is really in comparison with the national average in the country. So, uh, in essence, what the graph is showing us is that communities that have a community coalition uh, have lower uh, rates of use in these four substances uh, when compared to the rest of the country. Uh, more recently, the chart on the right shows uh, the reductions in the, the use of these four substances uh, in the communities uh, during that 2016 cohort. And as we can see, uh, they performed a little bit better than the overall national average of all of the communities that have gone through this program since the inception. Uh, but again, the important piece here is that in comparison to the rest of the country, communities that have a community coalition uh, have lower rates uh, in substance use, especially in these four substances that are being um, that are being tracked through the program in terms of past 30 day use for middle school and high school students. Now, in the United States, CATCA's model for community change is being applied in all 50 states and U.S. territories. And that's made possible through a national program that we have known as Drug-Free Communities. Uh, and Drug-Free Communities is uh, a program that was enacted into law back in 1998. And it was the second time in our country's history that they recognized the importance of having community coalitions as part of a prevention infrastructure. Uh, but it was also at that time that it became an official part of our country's national drug control strategy and resources were allocated to help develop community coalitions across the country. Uh, today, we have over 2,000 community coalitions that have participated in this program since its inception uh, back in 1998. And more, most recently, we have over 700 active coalitions uh, that are currently participating in this program. Um, and I do have to mention that CADCA uh, wasn't only a driving force in working with our national government uh, to get the passage of this act through, but we're also the training and technical assistance provider for every coalition that has to go through this program. So they're all trained uh, by CADCA on the same essential processes, those three pillars that we talked about, that's applied all throughout the United States and all these communities uh, where they're working to uh, create safe, healthy, and drug-free communities through the Drug-Free Community Support Program. Now, when we get started in doing the work of providing training and technical assistance and working with local partners to develop community coalitions, you know, most countries will start off with a small pilot project of maybe two, three communities uh, where this work takes place on the ground in a very organic way. As in many cases, when we're getting started in a country, coalitions haven't existed there before. Uh, so it's very much a learning process for us as it is for the community as they're teaching us you know, how, this, how these essential processes and practices would need to be adopted and applied within their own local community context. But after we get through that initial phase in the first couple of years of developing a pilot program, uh, there's really an opportunity for a multiplier effect and to take uh, this model to scale. Um, and, and once that happens, it's not just CADCA providing information on theory to practice, but really you have an important component, which is a peer-to-peer -peer component 
where coalition members are also able to teach others on uh, what they did and how they went about doing it in within their own community context. And, and similarly, that process, that multiplier effect has taken place in countries around the world. And uh, some of the logos that you see here on the slide are not of individual coalitions, but national networks or associations of community coalitions within uh, specific countries. And you can see from all these logos here, we have an association of coalitions in Mexico, where we have over 50 coalitions, or in Peru, where we have over 60 coalitions. But really today, we're going to take a real deep dive uh, into the association of anti-drug abuse coalitions in the Philippines and really learn uh, all about how this process has taken place uh, within the Filipino context. And, you know, without further ado, to talk about the Association of Anti-Drug Abuse Coalitions of the Philippines, I'm going to hand it over now to Dr. Raquel Tolentino uh, to share with you her story uh, as she's been working with us since the inception, since we did our first trainings uh, in the Philippines uh, back in 2012. Uh, so thank you all very much for your time. Um, and Dr. Raquel, I hand it over to you. Thank you, Eric. Let me now present to you the product of CADCA's coalition building efforts in the Philippines, the Association of Anti-Drug Abuse Coalitions of the Philippines, Incorporated. The ADAC Philippines, Incorporated is a non-stock, non-profit, non-government organization registered to the Securities and Exchange Commission. It is the umbrella organization of community coalitions which works closely with CADCA to promote the development of a drug prevention infrastructure through the engagement of local governments, institutions, and residents in the development of community coalitions in the Philippines. Our vision is to create a safe, peaceful, and drug-free communities in the country through the establishment of active and dynamic coalitions. Our mission, steered by the principles of social commitment and accountability, the ADAC Philippines Incorporated seeks to better the lives of the Filipinos by harnessing multi-sectoral participation to strengthen our stand against the spread of illegal substance in the country and eventually become drug-free. At present, there are 27 community coalitions in the Philippines under the umbrella of ADAC Phil covering Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. From Luzon, we have Basco Batanes from Region 1, Calumpit Bulacan from Region 3, and from the National Capital Region, we have two from Marikina, two from Muntinlupa, three from Quezon City, Makati, San Juan City, and Valenzuela City. From Region 4A, we have Tanay Rizal, Angono Rizal, Cavite City, Calamba Laguna, Santa Rosa Laguna, San Pedro Laguna, and Tayabas Quezon. From Region 4B, we have Calapan Mindoro and Puerto Princesa Palawan. From the Visayas, we have Calibo Clan, Malay, Pandan Antique, Iloilo City from Region 6. And from Region 7, we have Bacolod City. From Mindanao, we also have one from Sox Sargent, which is Kidapawan City. Coalition building in the Philippines started in 2012 through the training of coordinators, which is a grassroots training that lasted till 2016. This covers three cities in the National Capital Region, forming seven coalitions in the barangay level. Then we had the training of leaders from 2015 to 2019, where we established 20 more local coalitions. Through this Training of Leaders initiative, CADCA provided an intensive training and technical assistance to a select number of individuals in the Philippines with the expectation that they will return to their communities and initiate the development of community coalitions. The key activity of the TOL is a week-long training that CADCA holds in a centralized area. The intensive training provided the participants with the knowledge, skills, and abilities necessary to develop community coalitions. The participants were taught of the basic elements of community coalition, how to conduct community assessment, how to implement evidence-based strategies, and how to evaluate community-level initiatives. The goal of which is to increase the number of anti-drug community coalitions in the country. 
Here are the 27 coalitions under the umbrella of AADAC Philippines. As a legitimate association in the Philippines, AADAC Philippines has established its organizational structure, board policies, and accounting as required by the Securities and Exchange Commission. Our board members are elected every two years. Just like any other structured organization, we conduct quarterly board meetings and hold organizational and emergency meeting of coordinators as needed. Here are the services provided by AADAC Philippines in terms of building capacity and program assistance. For building capacity, we provide technical assistance and training for coalition members, encourage the recruitment of more members from different sectors involving the local government, barangays, and other non-government organizations. We assist in community assessment. We assist in planning and program implementation. We have peer-to-peer -peer mentoring. For our five-point program, we have drug abuse prevention and education for all sectors, program for out-of-school youth, drug-free establishments, workplace and school, drafting of anti-drug abuse policies, and workshop on the creation and strengthening of anti-drug abuse councils in local governments and barangay anti-drug abuse councils. As the association continues to grow, AADAC Philippines came up with a continuing education program for its coordinators and members through the first national conference with the theme, Building Coalitions for a Drug-Free Nation. This was held last May 2018. Through the support of the International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Bureau of the U.S. Embassy Manila and the Community Anti-Drug Coalition of America, we were able to gather our coalition leaders in one venue for updating, mentoring, continuous learning, consultations, and workshops for the sustainability and evaluation of our works in the community. We have also forged partnership and coordination with the national and local government to showcase our coalition products. With the success of the first national conference, we were able to launch the second national conference with the theme, Empowering the Youth in Coalition Building last October 2019. Aside from the continuing training and workshops provided by the Community Anti-Drug Coalition of America, we were able to conduct the election of our junior officers to serve as the voice of the youth in the Association of Anti-Drug Abuse Coalitions Board. AADAC Philippines was able to establish partnership and coordination with the national and local agencies in the country. We have been accredited by the Philippine Drug Enforcement Agency, or PIDEA, as one of their non-government organization partners in promoting the anti-drug advocacy through its education component. As a duly accredited partner, we are expected to promote the anti-drug advocacy by serving as catalyst for mobilizing the citizenry into action against dangerous drugs as part of its contribution to the national anti-drug campaign. We also had the support from the country's policy-making body, the Dangerous Drugs Board, headed by Secretary Catalino Cui, as we take part in community mobilizing in accordance with the Philippine anti-drug strategy and realizing the whole-of-nation approach in combating illegal drugs. We established partnership with the Office of the Undersecretary for External and Legal Affairs of the Department of Interior and Local Government on the proposed coalition expansion in the National Capital Region covering 17 more communities. Here's to show our strong partnership with the DILG Oyucela, headed by Undersecretary Rico Judge Echeveri and our first coordination meeting with the Anti-Drug Abuse Council focal persons of the local government units of the National Capital Region. The association also established partnership with the Public Information Office of the Philippine National Police headed by Brigadier General Bernard Banak for community promotion and coordination. In a press release last July 29, 2019, 
the Philippine National Police expressed its intent to adopt coalition building framework and make it part of the agency's wide strategy to forge partnerships with the public towards drug-free communities. The PNP added that it will continue to strengthen partnerships and establish more coalitions with various communities and anti-drug organizations and stakeholders to promote evidence-based approaches to reduce drug demand and to improve prevention and wellness programs. Aadak Philippines International Participation to Conferences, such as the International Society of Substance Use Professionals or ISUP, and the Community Anti-Drug Coalition of America Media Training Institute were mostly supported and sponsored by the INL-US Embassy Manila, headed by Director Brandon Hudspeth. National conferences held in the country were also a product of this strong partnership with INL. In June of 2018, Aadak Philippines was encouraged by Director Brian Morales, the Division Chief of Global Drug Demand Reduction programs of the U.S. Department of State, Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Affairs to become universal prevention curriculum education providers. ADAC Philippines also has an ongoing process of accreditation as a non-government organization with consultative status with the United Nations Economic and Social Council or UN ECOSOC. AADAC also established partnership with the local government and barangays as we continue to do fieldwork in coordination with the local anti-drug abuse councils. As a multi-sectoral organization, we forge partnership with other non-government organizations, private schools, and private companies. Here are the sectors that the AADAC will work with in the Philippines. From the government, from the national agencies, we have the Dangerous Drugs Board, Philippine Drug Enforcement Agency, Philippine National Police PIO, and the Department of Interior and Local Government. And then we have the local government units and barangays. For substance abuse organizations, we have the Interagency Council on Drug Abuse Prevention Education of the Dangerous Drugs Board. Youth organizations, we have Barcada Contra Droga, our youth coalition counterparts and student council organization. And from the parents, we have the Parents Teachers Association. From business, the Philippine Chamber of Commerce and Industry, business clubs, and private business owners. The media, we had UNTV and Lakbayi na Magandang Pilipinas. For health professionals, we have the Philippine Dental Association local chapters, private psychologists, and physicians. For religious sector, we have the Iglesia Ni Cristo, the CIPAG, NACFIL, and other local religious groups. For civic organizations, we have Kiwanis Club and Rotary Club. For law enforcement, we have the Philippine Drug Enforcement Agency Provincial Offices and the Philippine National Police. For youth serving organizations, we have the Sangguniang Kabataan and Junior Chamber International. And for schools, we have partnership with the local public and private schools. It is worth noting that the Philippine government mandates all local governments to establish their respective local anti-drug abuse councils. It is on the same mandate that each council must have at least two non-government organizations as part of its composition. Majority of our local coalitions use this as a platform to harness strong partnership with their respective local governments thus helping the coalitions to widen their resources. Lessons learned on the 12 community sectors, the Philippine experience. Coalition concept makes it possible for both government and stakeholders to work together, especially when roles are clearly defined. In the Philippines, the government acknowledges the valuable contribution of coalitions to the nationwide anti-drug strategy. Collaboration, as opposed to competition, is the key to successful coalition work. Now we would like to present to you two case studies done by two of our local coalitions in the Philippines. First, from the south, is the Community Anti-Drug Coalition of Calamba City to be presented by Ms. Rodora Agoncillo, the president of CAD CC. And then second is from the Visayas, the Community Anti-Drug Coalition of Bacolod, 
Alamba is a component city located at Caliber Zone in the Philippines, with over half a million population in 2019. And being a first-class component city, it has generated 4.2 billion pesos in income in the year 2019. One of its barangay, which is called Pansol, is the home to over 800 hot spring resorts that make the place a tourist destination to foreign and local visitors. It is number 10 richest city in the whole country as of 2019. Composed of 54 barangays, is spread to 29 upland and 25 lowland. Majority of its income were generated from tourism, industrial manufacturing companies, agriculture, and services. With a total land area of 14,480 hectares and composed of 54 barangays, it is a city with diversified social cultural activities. It is the home of our national hero and with rich heritage, which makes our city a site for different social cultural events from national and local institutions, making it vulnerable to various social problems such as drugs and peace and order, if not given ample attention and safeguards, will become more serious and dangerous to the welfare of our young generation. The emerging social problems in our community, particularly on drugs, lend itself in the birth of Community Anti-Drug Coalition of Calamba City or CADCC. The birthing of CADCC is a welcome development to most sectors that hold the same advocacy with us. Created as a coalition in August 5, 2017, two months after the Training of Leaders 2 conference, which were held in June of the same year, is sponsored by CADCA. At the conference, the core members of the coalition drafted the mission and vision which provide the CADCC its guiding foundation. Our mission, the coalition leads and moves the community of Calamba City in building, planning, and implementing efficient and effective drug prevention strategies. Our vision, a safe, healthy, orderly, peaceful, and drug-free Calamba City. In February 2018, the coalition was formally launched to the public by way of a kick-up that was attended and supported by the city mayor himself and other government officials. It was participated by 1,300 individuals from 12 colleges and universities, 27 public high schools and elementary schools, 42 barangays, 28 non-government organizations, and 12 religious groups and churches. A total of 111 institutions participated the said event. Our guests during the kickoff were Ms. Irina Green of CADCA, who led the oath of office to the CADCC officers, and Mr. Brandon Hadspeth of INL US Embassy Manila, who led the lighting of torch of commitment. It was the day that the loudest voice of the people in Calamba expressed their serious fight against drugs and substance abuse. Barangay Linga is a coastal barangay with 1,800 population and considered one of the most affected in the city in terms of drug affectation. The coalition was able to interview 25% of the adult population residing at Cervantes Espiritu Street in the said barangay. The number of adults residing in the said street is 280, ages 21 to 55 years old, or 70 individuals. 15% of the 70 interviewees, or 11 persons, confirmed that the drug trading is done at the end alley of Espiritu Street that is not visible to the CCTV installed by the barangay. According to the officials of the barangay, they cannot provide additional CCTV due to lack of funds. The interview was done after a series of dialogues with the officials and given them an assurance that all information gathered shall be held confidential and strictly for the use of the coalition. The substance in the presentation is shabu, which is the most prevalent substance being used in Barangay Linga. 15% of the interview is confirmed that trading of the substance is being done in a particular street in Barangay Linga.
and in one compound composed of 10 to 12 families situated along Cervantes Espiritu Street was also identified as a particular peddling area for Shabu. According to the barangay officials and adult population, majority of the parents cannot control their children and members of the family that are selling and using drugs. According to them, it is now a norm and the problem is too difficult to address too. They don't have the ability and the means to solve the problem. Belonging to the poorest family in the area, they could only hope to get additional income from selling of drugs in order to support the family daily needs. Having identified the problems, CADCC came up with the following strategies. Number one, massive information drive by posting tarpaulin and distribution of flyers in the entire barangay. Number two is building their skills by providing drug awareness and prevention education seminar to Barangay Linga residents and civic organization leaders, church lay leaders, elders, youth organization leaders and members, public transportation association leaders and members, or TODA. Number three, by providing support, Barangay Linga is considered as one of the poorest barangay in the city, and according to our survey, one of the pressing reasons that brought them to sell drugs is lack of financial resources to support their family. Therefore, one of the strategies being considered is the conduct of industrial training to residents such as mushroom culture. Number four, access and barriers. The result of the interview also depicted that during nighttime, specifically 10 in the evening until 5 in the morning, there was no regular patrolling at the Spiritu Street. We officially sent our recommendation to the officers of Barangay Linga to post regularly patrol watchmen on the said area. Number 5. Incentive and Disincentives The coalition proposed the recognition of different barangays who efficiently and effectively implemented different city ordinances. It is a city-wide in its scope that those barangay who implemented effectively city ordinances that pertain to drug prevention and other related peace and order ordinances shall be recognized by the end of every year. Ordinances such as liquor ban, curfew hour, limitation on street social gathering. Number six is physical design. The coalition formally reported to the mayor and requested him on the additional CCTV needed by the Barangay Linga and it was implemented. And number seven, policies and regulations. Barangay resolution was passed on the constant monitoring of the area and an additional patrol watchman was assigned. The coalition intervention effort, it was focused on massive information drive. We particularly conducted information drive in the area where trading and drug deal is happening. We conducted lectures and group discussions with TODA and other transport leaders. Distribution of leaflets are repeatedly done in the whole barangay. According to our member from Linga, the trading has been lowered significantly and confirmed by LGU and police reports that selling and using of drugs at the end of 2018 was lowered by 30%. And in early 2019, major drug source was neutralized. Our next case study is from our coalition in Visayas, the Community Anti-Drug Coalition of Bacolod City. Bacolod City is at the northwestern coast of the province of Negros Occidental. They have a population of 561,875 and 61 barangays. The Anti-Drug Coalition of Bacolod is also a structured organization and registered to the Securities and Exchange Commission. They hold monthly regular board meetings 
and annual membership meetings. When they first launched their coalition, they were able to mobilize their youth and education sector through their media information campaign. Almost all their events were supported by the local government and the barangays. They also have the support from the Department of Education. Coalition identified Poroxibukaw of Barangay Banago as their hotspot. Here is a view of Poroxibukaw where the Community Anti-Drug Coalition of Bacolod conducted their community assessment. The community assessment focused on Poroxibukaw in Barangay Banago. And methamphetamine is a substance that is commonly used as per reports. Poroxibukaw is a fish port at Barangay Banago that operates from 12 a.m. to 6 a.m. Porters need to stay awake to wait for the transport of market seafoods. The selling of methamphetamine in the dark streets of Poroxibukaw has been ongoing for years. There has been no sufficient manpower to patrol the area and no police visibility, especially at night, because the whole Poroc has no street lights. Sources of their community assessment were from interviews, observations, and police report. Here's CADCOB's logic model showing where methamphetamine is being sold and used in Barangay Banago. Based on the local condition, CADCOB were able to recommend the following comprehensive strategies for Poroxibukaw in Barangay Banago. In providing information, the community residents were informed through a newsletter on the barangay schedule of curfew. For building skills, training was provided for the Barangay Anti-Drug Abuse Council, Barangay Police and Residents on drug abuse prevention and local resolutions regarding the curfew. Logistical support were also provided for the volunteers of the Citizen Patrol who monitors the curfew. For access and barriers, the barangay provided checkpoints and outposts, and their standard visibility in Poroxibukaw streets. For incentives and disincentives, rewards are given to the Citizens Patrol volunteers for constantly monitoring the curfew at Poroxibukaw. And for those who were caught out past curfew, will render community service to the barangay. For physical design, the coalition proposed for the installation of streetlights and CCTV in Poroxibukaw. A barangay ordinance for curfew was also passed by the Barangay Council, which also mobilizes the citizens patrol. Here's to show the implementation of strategies of the Community anti drug Coalition of Bacolod to address their local condition. From the dark streets of Poroxibukao, street lights were installed and the area was lighted and visible and can be easily monitored. As an overview, the coalition in identified Barangay Banago as their hotspot and after the conduct of community assessment, it has been identified that selling of methamphetamine was identified in the dark streets of Poroxibukao. As a result of their proposal to the new government center of Bacolod, the mayor ordered for the installation of streetlights on the said Purok to prevent drug deals in the area. Regular roving in the areas of Tanods has also become a practice and curfew hours are now being observed. The coalition conducted drug prevention sessions in the communities. Due to the increase in awareness, now the coalition together with the community work hand in hand to ensure that these areas will remain free from any drug-related activities. Aadak Philippines during the pandemic Aadak Philippines continue to provide technical assistance to our local coordinators through online consultations and discussions with the Community Anti-Drug Coalition of America trainers, Mr. David Aguilar and Ms. Irina Green. We also participated in the anti-drug online meetings initiated by the Department of Interior and Local Government headed by Undersecretary R.J. Echeverry and the Dangerous Drugs Board Undersecretary Benjamin Reyes together with other non-government organizations working hand-in-hand -hand with the national government. We continue to have online board meetings, peer-to-peer -peer mentoring and consultative discussions. 
some of our local coalitions continue to provide information awareness through film showing in curfew holding centers and distribute IEC materials provided by the Philippine Drug Enforcement Agency during their relief goods distribution. There are also coalition members who take part in the drafting and dissemination of COVID-related guidelines and policies in their respective provinces. Aadak Philippines on Task Force COVID Most of our coalition leaders volunteered for Task Force COVID as frontliners. There are coalition leaders who help in the house-to-house -house distribution of relief goods to the communities. There are also those who share their own cooked foods and donate PPEs to hospitals and clinics where most of our health professionals work as volunteers. And most of all, there are those who share the biggest contribution to fight this pandemic by staying at home, bond, and care for their families. Though we came from different cities and municipalities, we are one in fighting this battle, just as we fight for our advocacy. Together we believe that we will heal as one. Well, this concludes our presentation, and uh, I just want to take this opportunity uh, to thank Dr. Raquel Tolentino and Ms. Rodora Angosillo for uh, sharing your experiences today on uh, the development of community anti-drug coalitions in the Philippines. Uh, I know we covered uh, a lot of ground today and I do want to provide a, uh, a bit of time here now that we're at the end of the presentation uh, for a question and answer piece. Now, uh, there's a couple of ways we can go about doing this. Uh, on your screen, you should have uh, two options, and uh, this is to, to our audience with us today, uh, where you can uh, submit a question. You can either click on the Q&A box and, um, you know, uh, submit a question uh, that you'd like for us to answer, or you can also uh, click the button to raise your hand so that uh, we can see who has a question that they would like to offer to the panel and uh, to assist in moderating uh, this piece, uh, Irina Green uh, from our team here at CADCA will be um, assisting in fielding uh, questions and uh, unmuting microphones uh, so those of you can, uh, can take the opportunity to ask any questions of uh, either me, Dr. Raquel, uh, or um, uh, Rodora. So thank you all very much. Uh, and I hand it over to Irina uh, for the Q&A portion. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Uh, greetings, everyone. And thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we are delighted to see our friends from all over the world. I see Indonesia. I see, of course, the Philippines. Uh, I see South Africa, Kenya, and others. So great to have all of you here today. And as Eric mentioned, we're going to move into our Q&A uh, segment. If you have any questions, please either uh, raise your hand uh, or uh, you can just type your question in the Q&A uh, box or chat box, whatever is more convenient for you. Uh, let me start my video. So far, I don't see any hands. Let's see, I see a new message. Okay, congratulations. All right, I see q and I I have uh, one question from Miss Clara. Uh, she's our friend from South Africa. Welcome, Clara. She's asking, what kind of support do the two coalitions receive from the sectors? Uh, good, good, uh, good day to everyone uh, for that question. The support the, that uh, is given by the, the coalition is uh, uh, our um, participation with the local government unit. We suggested for the Whatever support they can they can share for the people who participated or uh, have the, be a part of the activity of the 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 coalition. Good evening, everyone. Um, uh, each sector of the coalition has their own part in uh, in uh, in uh, doing. Uh, 
for instance, in programs, they have their own tasking, they have their own committee. So uh, one of their uh, greatest contribution is their time. First is their time. Second is their participation, participation in all the activities. And then third is to accept tasking of whatever committee they handle, so they do their tasking well. So I think uh, that's uh, one of the best uh, contribution that each sector provides. So for instance, we have the business sector. So the business sector, sometimes they can provide resources for programs and activities of the coalition. The youth sector, um, they provide uh, a support. They provide the, the uh, support also with their young generations when it comes to providing uh, uh, preventive education or trainings and seminars for the youth. And uh, for other sectors, like the health professionals, um, uh, they, they take part in uh, health, uh, health concerns or even uh, other activities that concerns, um, that, that concerns their, uh, um, their specialty or their, uh, 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 their knowledge on whatever, on whatever program or activities that we have. For instance, um, in local government units, uh, when we have this um, community-based uh, treatment programs, um, we have uh, members of the health sectors who help in drafting the local government units, plans and programs for those who have surrendered for um, treatment. So every sector has its own part and ev uh, every coalition has its own uh, committee wherein uh, people, uh, the members choose uh, which committee they would like to join or they would like to participate or they would like to assist in. Thank you so much, uh, Raquel. I'm going to unmute Ms. Doris uh, so she can also add to the discussion. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, regarding the CADCC, LGU took a significant part as one of the major sectors. They helped us in connecting to the different barangays as well as the DILG. They helped us in contacting the barangay leaders, the barangay captains, whenever we'll have our trainings and even those research before implementing it. And also the Sangunian. Sangunian is the legislative body of the city. They helped us in the push of our uh, proposed ordinances so that we can um, help the city in, you know, in preventing the proliferation of drug addiction and all related drug or substance abuses in the city. And also this significant role of the DSWD, Department of Social Welfare and Development. This sector helped us also in the research part or what Sir Eric uh, said earlier, the data-driven strategies. They help us in research and providing us information that they have already in existence. So different sectors have different roles and these are our experiences with these sectors. Thank you so much, Ms. Doris. Our next question is from Jamie from Plato Foundation in Surabaya, Indonesia. Uh, could we get tonight's presentations by email? Uh, yes, we will definitely send the link uh, to this webinar, so you will have the uh, copy of it. Thank you. Uh, next question is from uh, Ms. Farida uh, Rashid. What kind of challenges did you, uh, on the effort of engaging, I guess, what kind of challenges did you experience on the effort of engaging the 12 community sectors, especially from the government? Raquel, um, would you like yes, to respond? Uh -huh. um, thank you, Farida. Um, one of the challenges that our coalition experienced when we were just starting is that um, when we form uh, the coalitions in the grassroots level or in the barangay level, some of the officials that were elected as uh, officers of these coalitions are officials of the local government or officials of the barangay. So what happened was, when these officials uh, uh, stepped down from the government service, then the coalition became low or um, the, the coalition became weak 
because the coalition became very dependent from the government. But uh, uh, when we had this training of leaders, so we, we, uh, we uh, encouraged them, the coalitions that are being organized, we encouraged them uh, not to put government officials on board. So they can be part of the sectors, but uh, we discourage them to be elected as president or, ch or chairman of the coalition so that um, the coalition will not be identified for a, cert uh, for a certain co uh, politician. So I think that's one thing that uh, makes uh, this coalition stable now. And with the help now of the national agencies like the Department of Interior and Local Government, and with the other agencies like the DDB, the PNP, the PIDEA. So we were, we were being recognized by the local government units and they have seen this, um, uh, this advantage of having a coalition in their community, which will help them in creating action plan for their local government and for their barangays and uh, which will assist them in uh, community assessment as well. So um, this uh, makes our partnership with the government through the, the anti-drug abuse councils that they have in the local government. This makes our partnership with them stronger this time. Thank you so much, Raquel. Uh, and we have another question from Clara. Uh, during the COVID-19, obviously there is a need to take precautionary measures. Does your country allow physical community activities for you to continue with coalition work on the ground? Dr. Raquel? Yes, as, as shown on the slides, um, most of us have the coalition work online. So we have uh, online TA. We were given technical assistance by CADCA. So we also use uh, uh, Zoom or Microsoft Teams in conducting uh, our meetings, like emergency meetings or uh, as actually as of uh, as uh, during this pandemic, we meet a lot. Then we're in the normal uh, in the normal situation because we used to have a quarterly meeting, but now. Um, we used to we used to talk or we used to meet uh, every other two weeks, so that we we are uh, we were able to prepare for uh, for our works after this pandemic, and then um, with this uh, with this pandemic also we were able to realize uh, those gaps that we miss uh, during our uh, uh, in our coalition works like. Uh, the importance or some uh, some factors that we forgot in doing our community assessment, like how we could do uh, date, our data gathering better and how we could forge a partnership with other national and local agencies. So uh, this pandemic uh, gives way for us to realize and uh, check on the gaps uh, that we miss in implementing our coalition works. Uh, thank you so much, Raquel. Uh, and we have, I see a hand. Okay, let me unmute. Mm -hmm. Okay, please, Mr. Were. MC Elfa Zwere, I'm the coordinator of Kasarani Community and Drug and Coalition in Kenya. My question anyway is, uh, I'm passionate about the youth as an ambassador of young people. And in this good coalition work they have done, the presenters have presented it to us. What is the, what was the role or what was the percentage of the young people in this whole amount of work? Because I know most of the time they rarely participate in coalitions or in such a kind of work. So I wanted to know if, what, what percentage of young people did they work with? Thank you again. Raquel, were you able to hear? Um, the last part, yeah, but, but I can answer yes. the first. So what the percentage first part, yeah. of the young people are working with the coalitions? Uh, they will, uh, we would like to hear uh, on the youth engagement uh, in, in your coalitions in the Philippines. Yeah, right. Okay, so, yeah, the last national conference, uh, we were able to design, uh, the, design the conference for the youth, actually, uh, for us to have a youth counterpart and uh, for them to have a voice in the board. So because we recognize uh, the importance of the youth being the most vulnerable um, 
sector in the society. Uh, so um, in, here in the Philippines, we have what we call the Sangguniang Kabataan, and these are elected youth officials in the barangay level. So we thought of having this youth counterpart by tapping uh, these youth officials or the Sangguniang Kabataan together with uh, the uh, other youth organizations, other youth serving organizations in the country to participate in our coalition because we know that uh, for us to be able to uh, to make sure that uh, we have a good program for the youth, we have to ha we have to hear from them on what they need and uh, what they want for their community. So uh, we engage them since uh, this is also part of their advocacy and this is also uh, this is also one of uh, one of the things that they, they want to have in their community. So we engage them and we involve them in the coalition building uh, efforts so that uh, we would be able to uh, train them and make sure that we work as one. So we hear from them uh, and then we, we also work with them to have uh, programs in their own uh, community. Since uh, also uh, the Sangguniang Kabataan, or those officials in the barangay level, have their own budget coming from uh, from the government, so they want to spend it right. So we thought that um, guiding them would be of great help to implement good anti-drug abuse programs for their uh, barangays or for their uh, city or municipality. Thank you so much, Dr. Raquel. Uh, and we have another question from Laudemir Labra. Uh, can we start this coalition on the barangay level? Do we need to coordinate it first uh, with our municipal government? Okay, so uh, as you've seen in our presentation, the first thing that we do in 2012 is to do it in the barangay level. Uh, so, uh, but now, um, as we as we are about to start with region, we were thinking of um, uh, having it uh, at the city level, because since in the Philippines we have this what we call the anti drug abuse council, which is mandated by the Department of Interior and Local Government, where in uh, all municipalities and cities should uh, should have this uh, council. Uh, under this Anti-Drug Abuse Council are the Barangay Anti-Drug Abuse Council, which they organize also in the barangay level as mandated also by the Department of Interior and Local Government. So we thought that we coordinate first with the municipal or, uh, or, or city, city local government unit. And then as we organize a coalition building, we will in, uh, involve all the barangays under the city or municipality through the help of the Municipal Anti-Drug Abuse Council or the City Anti-Drug Abuse Council. Ms. Rina, can I add something? Of course. Mm -hmm. Yes, Ms. Okay. Doris. Uh, that is very important that you should coordinate first with the local government, the city government or the municipality, and then they will link you to the DILG. What I'm doing is I'm attending the regular meeting of the barangay captains. That is once a month. So I'm attending and I'm presenting what CAD, what CAD CC is and our advocacy is. So it is a lot easier for us to deep down on every barangay if you're going to implement any program. And going back to the question before this, because uh, the person asked that, um, the degree or the level of the participation of our youth in this uh, coalition. First, we're focused on the community. And the next, we're into the different schools. Actually, we were able to um, conduct trainings and seminar to six national high schools in Calamba City. What I did was I took two, two young people to be part of the training to be part of the speakers, actually. I spoke and then another adult spoke and then two another young people spoke during the training. So that is the significant part that I gave them and what they have contributed to the coalition. Hopefully it will help them. They can do the same and uh, to encourage more young people because I can see that this young audience can relate 
much or easier if the speaker is of the same age with them. So that is the contribution that our young people have given to the coalition, have contributed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Doris. Uh, and we have uh, another question from uh, Mr. Arniel Romero. How is the support of every LGU? Dr. Talentino, would you like to respond? Um, that most of the local government units, um, <clears throat> actually, uh, those, uh, those cities and municipalities that we have coalitions, uh, the local government unit acknowledges uh, these coalitions to be part of their anti-drug abuse council. For those local government units who doesn't have a strong anti-drug abuse council, um, they even tap these coalitions uh, to be their movers or to, uh, uh, to, to be their workers, you know, because uh, the, difference, the difference between um, the Anti-Drug Abuse Council and these coalitions is that the, the Anti-Drug Abuse Council changes from time to time once the mayor or the barangay chairman um, step down from position. So it happens all the time in the Philippines that if we change our mayor, if we change our barangay chairman, the whole Anti-Drug Abuse Council uh, will be changed. The manpower will be changed. But then with this coalition, if this uh, coalition stays in partnership with the local government, whoever sits in as mayor or whoever sits in as barangay chair, this coalition remains because this is their advocacy and they will work in partnership of, of whoever sits in the position in the Anti-Drug Abuse Council or in the, uh, in, the pos in the position as elected officials. So I think, Irina, this question is if every LGU is open for an ad hoc. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. it is. Uh, and Arniel just clarified. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Pastor, is that you? Yes, Pastor Arniel. Um, uh, Adak Field is open for all LGUs, for all local government units. It's just that um, uh, if you could see that uh, as of now, we have 27 coali active coalitions. It's because uh, before, we used to work with local government units who acknowledges um, Adak Phil, who are, who, or who acknowledges coalition building. But now, with the help of the ILG realizing the importance of um, having this uh, CADCA model or having this uh, uh, framework that CADCA introduces to the country, then um, the, the DILG uh, want, uh, works uh, now supported the ADAC field so that we would be able to work with other local government, government units in the country. So yes, we are open for uh, assisting local government units, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and we have another question. Uh, thank you for your presentation. It's excellent. I'm Hendra Jeet from National Narcotic Board, BNN Indonesia. Want to ask uh, Dr. Raquel, do you have instruments to measure program success and failure? Can it be shared with us? Thank you. So Dr. Raquel, uh, do you have instruments to measure program success and failure? And if so, can it be shared? Um, as of now, sir, we have, um, we have the results of our community assessment, our roadmap, our strategies, and then uh, the, um, the implementation of which program. So um, we are now um, proposing to the national government for the, uh, we have this community assessment proposal wherein we include data gathering and data analysis. So, because we would like to work on this one. Um, with regards to data, uh, we, ha we have uh, data coming from our barangay and our, um, our national agencies since we have this um, number of surrenderies, I mean those who surrendered for treatment. We have this number of surrenderies per barangay, so we were able also to assess um, the drug problem. Uh, in each area. And uh, with regards to our coalition works, 
uh, it is made uh, it, it, it's easier for us now to to check on whether there's a reduce in the number of use or selling in in our barangay as we implement uh, the strategies that we have. So yes, we can share it with you, sir. Thank you so much. And our next question is, in this time, the new normal, are there any new kind of strategies that CAT will share uh, with the coalition, like this kind of approach use, using the social media? Eric, would you like to uh, answer this question? Uh, so, yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, you know, this, uh, as Dr. Raquel has mentioned, this, uh, this time with COVID-19 has been uh, an opportunity to uh, reflect on uh, practices uh, and the way we go about doing things as, uh, as we do realize that uh, a lot of this work uh, really has happened traditionally in face-to-face uh, -face and uh, uh, we're having to make, uh, uh, to recalibrate, to make adjustments, uh, to be able to engage under these environment in this new environment. Um, and some of the ways that we've been going um, about doing this uh, is, is really uh, adaptation and migration uh, to virtual platforms. Uh, so we've developed a strategic plan over the, the next year ahead uh, to really engage and use these types of platforms and uh, in this specific webinar is, uh, is within that, uh, that plan, which is uh, from the short term basis to continue to engage uh, the coalition networks uh, that are in all the countries. We've mentioned some here today. Uh, we have some of our friends from Kenya as well as the Philippines, uh, obviously to continue to engage through virtual technical assistance. Dr. Raquel spoke about that. Uh, but also uh, continuing to engage our coalitions uh, through topic-specific webinars, as well um, as regional uh, and national engagement of our coalition networks to, uh, again, a lot of the, the work, the coalitions uh, uh, are in and of themselves uh, the catalyst for change. Uh, so uh, we want to make sure that with the network engagement we're doing, whether it's at the local or regional or national level, uh, the coalitions are also to, able to interact and share uh, best practices in terms of uh, how they've had to reprioritize uh, and move forward um, in this new space. And from a training and technical assistance perspective, um, you know, when we talk about uh, countries like the Philippines or, or Indonesia, we have um, a huge time difference. So the way we would train, uh, where Dr. Raquel spoke a little bit of our face-to-face -face modalities training, of coordinators and communities versus training of leaders, uh, you know, we're look, really looking at being able to, you know, develop new systems which are already in process, uh, where um, there'll be online uh, courses where uh, participants can, you know, go in, receive the content, and then uh, have uh, follow-ups with with the trainers and the coordinators there in country uh, to continue to move the process forward. Um, and as far as social media, we've seen um, not just from Katika's perspective, but you know, again, it's 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 allowed for another level of engagement that really didn't exist before, where we were doing the work. It's very bilateral. So what we were doing in the Philippines was happening in the Philippines with partners like Adak Phil, and what was happening in Indonesia was happening in Indonesia with partners like Granite and Plateau. Uh, but now we're seeing in several regions of the world where those lines, those barriers, are, are kind of eroding. Um, and uh, the engagement, the interaction, uh, and the way forward um, is, uh, is really kind of the sharing across cultures, across countries, and across borders. Uh, so for example, we have uh, uh, co uh, Portuguese-speaking coalitions in Brazil and a pretty advanced network, much like the Philippines, uh, but we also have coalitions in Cape Verde uh, that we haven't been able to reach for a couple of years. But now when our partners in, uh, say, Brazil have a Facebook Live event uh, where they're providing their training and technical assistance, our friends from other countries are able to tap into that. Uh, so really, in that sense, social media has also proven a, a phenomenal strategy as we continue to, to migrate all of our practices uh, to virtual and online platforms. Uh, social media is really allowing to break down barriers 
so that we have uh, not only engagement within specific countries, but at the regional level, the national level, and, and, uh, and the global level. I hope that answers the question, Matthew. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, everyone, uh, for your questions and for your active participation. Uh, Dr. Raquel, uh, would you like to make closing remarks? Um, Irina, I would like to acknowledge the presence of our DILG Undersecretary, Rico Judge Echeverri. Maybe we could ask for some message from him. Sure, that would be great. Undersecretary Echeverri, it's great to have you here with us. Would you like to say a couple of words? Yes. Um, again, good evening to all of you. Well, good evening in the Philippines. Looking forward, of course, to the 1000 Coalition, which Dr. Rajeg has promised me. And since we have a new PDEA chief, uh, which is uh, Director General Wilkins, I'm looking forward to uh, having a stronger ties on coalition building. Not only coalition building, but uh, on uh, the demand reduction aspect. Uh, I'm sure Dr. Rajeg, with her experience and with the group's experience, can look into improving on the audit system we are doing for all local government. And we are now trying to integrate what Eric Siervo has already recommended for our audit in the local government vis-a-vis -vis with the principles of ADCA. Uh, I am hoping and praying that the, the cure for COVID will eventually be uh, discovered and we get to the new normal but looking forward to improving further so that come the new normal we will be implementing fully whatever principles we have learned so far in CADCA. Again more power to CADCA and rest assured our support in developing more coalitions for the Philippines. Thank you. Salamat uh, po. Thank you very much. And Secretary, and thank you again for all of your support for the coalition building efforts uh, in the Philippines. Dr. Yes, we're looking forward to having you, uh, Irina. Thank you. I look forward to coming back. Thank you. Dr. Raquel, anything else? Yes, uh, I would like to thank Undersecretary Rico Judge Echeverri for the support uh, that he's been uh, providing for our ADAC Philippines. Um, we look forward to more works in partnership with DILG. Also, I would like to thank uh, those who uh, join us tonight from Kenya, South Africa, and Indonesia. I hope I didn't forget uh, anybody. And also, syempre, from the Philippines, mga kabayan, maraming salamat sa ating mga kasama po sa Pilipinas, sa iba't ibang coalition po dito po sa ating bansa, sa ating national uh, coordinators, to all our board members. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. And of course, our big thanks to Kadka, uh, Eric, Irina, David, uh, Fabricia, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for uh, giving us uh, the opportunity to, to learn and to uh, to do uh, something different for our country with regards to our battle with the uh, with, uh, uh, drug problem. So thank you very much. I hope you learned from this um, webinar tonight. Thank you so much, Dr. Talentino. Eric, uh, would you like to um, uh, conclude? Absolutely. I would just uh, like to, uh, you know, again, reiterate uh, what Dr. Raquel said, thanking everyone uh, from uh, all over Southeast Asia, Africa, uh, and other the par parts of the world joining us here today. Uh, again, uh, thanking um, uh, our uh, Undersecretary RJ for joining us this evening as well. And uh, uh, let's see, I don't, don't see her now, but we also had representatives from INL Manila. Uh, Joan on the line thanking INL for their support um, uh, through the years and making this work possible in the Philippines. Uh, and again, um, you know, uh, to Dr. Raquel uh, and uh, her illustrious team of, of coordinators and coalitions uh, who are doing the all-inspiring work in the Philippines to be effective change agents 
uh, you know, as I said in the beginning, we can be there to provide training and technical assistance, but unless people uh, like uh, they have throughout uh, the 27 communities where we have coalitions in the Philippines, uh, take that journey to make it theirs. Uh, there isn't uh, much to say, but in this case, we have a remarkable story to tell uh, because so many uh, community leaders have been uh, empowered to be effective change agents. And again, uh, I wanna personally thank Dr. Raquel Tolentino for her leadership and her relentless work uh, throughout the Philippines. Uh, she is really uh, just a driving force out there and uh, none of this would have been possible without you. So thank you for your amazing work, Dr. Raquel, for Irina, for all the amazing work that you and David do to provide the technical support uh, to the coalitions uh, in the Philippines. And again, again congratulations to all uh, for uh, this remarkable effort. And, uh, and again, thank you all uh, for uh, you know, joining us. We're a little bit over time here, but I wanna thank you all for uh, sticking with us for over an hour and a half here as we still have 46 participants on the line. So um, again, uh, thank you all for your commitment as many of you are also doing uh, amazing work back in your own countries uh, to create safe, healthy, and drug-free communities. Thank you.